Ghana Armed Forces has launched an operation to rid the country's border communities of suspected terrorists, some of whom have disguised themselves as nomadic headsmen. The operation is also to ensure illegal immigrants and others living unlawfully in the country are sent back to their countries. In an interview with Joy News, Deputy Defense Minister Kofi Amankwame said so far over 20,000 persons have been repatriated to their countries, with more expected in the coming days. What is happening is that our neighboring countries, Burkina, uh, Burkina Faso, Togo, and then Cote d'Ivoire, are conducting uh, some security operations, you know, to deal with the issue of um, terrorism groups. And so most people are sitting here in Ghana. So we have a lot of people coming into Ghana. And uh, our intelligence is that some of these armed groupings, you know, uh, terrorists, uh, um, persons have disguised themselves into headsmen, into illegal immigrants, and all that, you know, trying to uh, come into our country. And so the various research have been cut to deal with the situation. And the Ghana Armed Forces uh, is also assessing the various uh, research, you know, along our, our borders to deal with the situation. So basically, we are acting on intelligence and trying to do that. Obviously, a new uh, intelligence, you know, uh, indicates that you are a terrorist or you belong to any terrorist group. We cannot allow you to be in this country. So basically, we're trying as much as possible to respect the movement and then to make sure that we do proper screening to really know who and who is coming to this country. Basically, that is all your I mean, under the circumstances, it will be difficult to even tell how many we're going to have today or tomorrow because they are coming in groups. And so it will be difficult to put a figure to, to how many people are coming in. But, you know, some of them, the, the, this figure is really conservative because you have some not going to proper channels to come to uh, this country. Others are using, you know, unapproved uh, routes. But these are the ones we 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 been able to capture approximately. That is the number, and uh, I think a lot more will come. But we are trying to do our best to make sure that we 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 have proper screening, and then we do that, which is right for the security of our. General Secretary of the NPP, Justin Kodia, is cautioning all 10 flag bearer aspirants to be measured and exercise decorum in their campaigns. According to him, the party has a bigger task ahead to break the eight which he believes could be affected by their actions and inactions. His comments uh, follows the release of the vetting committee's report, which has cleared all 10 aspirants to contest the flag bearership race. He spoke to my colleague Samuel Mbura. Yesterday, the steering committee of our party, which is mandated with the day-to-day -day management of the party, looked at the recommendation, except to say that the steering committee is not clothed with the power to vary or accept the recommendation by the virtual committee, but rather to pass it on to the national council, which has the authority to either accept or reject the recommendation by the Vetting Committee. But as I speak to you, per the recommendation by the Vetting Committee, all the 10 personalities who appear before the Vetting Committee, in the words of the Vetting Committee, are eligible to contest the party's uh, presidential plans. The recommendation by the Vetting Committee is not binding on national national council is the side the second side the board of the party. Maybe they may be privy to certain information that the voting committee did they have. And nothing stopped the national council from varying the recommendation of the voting committee. Well uh, barring any unforeseen circumstances or uh, activities happening, I'm very sure the the number will be more than five. So certainly there will be uh, especially the legal college. For that one, I'm, I'm very sorry. The process has not ended. We have a bigger tax ahead of us in 2024 to become the first political party to have won election on three consecutive occasions, which means that their actions and inactions, their utterances should be measured 
to reflect the unity that we need in the party to also make the reconciliation after the election very easy for all of us. So my word of advice to all of them and their supporters is to be measured in their chances and also to have the party's interest first at heart before any other interest comes in. So it is important that we all work together as a party to ensure that everyone's uh, statement or everyone's campaign is in the forum. It also shows a challenge to us as national party. Our duty as referees is to make sure that the processes leading to the elections are also free, fair, transparent, and also peaceful. It also makes it easy for everyone. Well, one of the aspirants, uh, who is also former Minister for Regional Cooperation and Trades and Industry in the Eswa Kufu administration, Dr. Kofi Kunedu Apreko, told Joy News about how he felt sidelined by his good friend and brother, the President Ekofuado, in the formation of his government, despite promises he will get a ministerial appointment. Speaking on PM Express with Evans Mensa, Dr. Apreko talked about a perceived betrayal by a team he trusted so much to have his expertise for the advancement of Ghana's development. I was the campaign manager for Mr. President Kufuado in 2008. 2012, I was in charge of security. And the last one that I did not have any position, I worked very hard with him. I went to everywhere that I could go. But I was not offered any position. Would you have wanted one? Uh, if obviously, if it was offered to me, yes, I would have accepted it. I mean, if one that I wanted was offered to me or what one that want? I could have made. What did you want? No, well, my background is in, in, in finance, economics. So any of those finance related, I've been, to trade, have, I've been a trade minister before. I've been a member of You would have preferred a trade minister and a Kufado's government? I would not have preferred a trade minister because I've been a trade minister. And a I finance thought, minister? Well, my background, I wouldn't have mine at all. You would yes. have accepted it? Yes. Mm. But he but, stuck with Kenneth Furiata. Yes. So I had to find a job. And so I do understand it's not a betrayal. If anything at all, it should be the reverse. That they betrayed I, you? Well, whatever you want to, they did not find a use for me. A use for me that was appropriately packaged. Did or, you, did, did you... Did you make yourself available? I was available it? very much. And, and uh, there's no doubt about that. But these are private issues. Yeah. The president is your friend. You served with him. Well, you could more have than him. a friend. You could have, you could have more called than him. We are just like brothers at one point. Yeah, for me to have his confidence. How, how do you feel when you were ignored? When I was ignored? Well, they didn't say I, you are ignored. They say that you get this and this and this, and it keeps going off. You made you promises? Yes, yes. Promises such as? Oh, that is not something that I... I was mentioned... Some ministries were mentioned to me. Before you won power or after? We won power and after both. Before, before and, and after. after. You were but promised. they didn't come true. You were promised ministries before and after, and none of that was, those promises were not kept? No. By your good friend, the president? Yes. That's former Trade Minister with Evans Minister on PM Express last night. Now, former Cocoa Board CEO Dr. Seven Opune has filed a motion at the Supreme Court in a bid to have his criminal trial start afresh. The Court of Appeal last week directed the High Court to rely on record of proceedings already guarded as against having a fresh trial despite a new judge taking over the case. Lawyers for Mr. Opune today told the High Court they disagree with this decision and intend Tend to urge the Supreme Court to set it aside. Legal Affairs Correspondent Joseph Akable joins us with more. Akable, what other details have we gathered about this latest application? They understand from the documents we have found, the latest point is that as far as they are concerned, they believe that the court of appeal was wrong in directing that they could use the record of the previous proceedings. They were making a case that in terms of what has been so far, they believe that. The High Court was right in taking a view that was fair to all sides 
that the case starts as yet and not to rely on records that are being devoted to allegations and counter allegations. Mm. So let's talk about the proceedings at the High Court. We understand a new judge has taken over after the previous was transferred, and already there are concerns about the accuracy of court records. Records. Bring us up to speed on that. So Justice Abuadi Tando has been tasked to hear the case now, following the transfer of Justice uh, Amotikima to the Ashanti region. Uh, in court, the lawyers from Dr. Puni indicated that they wanted the record of court proceedings to ascertain it, uh, to determine whether it is accurate, even before uh, they proceed to allow for the trial to continue. So that was the concern they raised, and the judge said that it was only fair that all sides have the record of proceedings. So the case has been adjourned to July 25, for those proceedings to be made available to all sides. Joseph Akable is our court correspondent with updates on the Opuni case. Let's get on to the streets of Akumase in the Ashanti region because they roam the streets in the day. They make a living at lorry terminals and they pass the night under bridges and open spaces. At Asafo, one of the biggest lorry terminals in Kumase, the menace of streetism continues to be a threat to society and a worry to city authorities. There's more in this report. The space under the Asafo interchange is home to scores of people, mostly children who are often at the risk of sexual abuse. They are either chased out by domestic violence, drug and alcohol abuse, death of a parent, family breakdown and other social economic factors. Mafia is heavily pregnant. She sleeps under the Asafo interchange despite the unfavorable weather. She became a commercial sex worker after the death of both parents. She cannot track her external family because she was born on the street. She already has one child who has been adopted due to poor parenting. Mathia says life on the street is difficult, but she has no option than to resume her sex for money business after delivery. <laughs> We have no helper. We are always gallivanting on the streets. My parents are divorced. Right now, I have two children. I don't work. At first, I was a sex worker, but I'm unable to do that now. Yet, I have plans of going back to it. I plead with the authorities to come to my aid. Others share similar experiences. I have lost both parents. My extended family have left me to my fate. At night, I hit the streets and engage in sex work to get money for food. I had a fight with a friend, so I rushed out of home to sleep here. I came here around 2015. I only load goods to survive. I sleep under the overhead. There are so many thieves here. They rob me all the time. I would be glad if I could go back to where I used to work, at least to survive. These children living on the street want the government to assist them start apprenticeship. 
No ma bo am me free ah. Na no ma kwa ko pe o mo di ma to e tele bo. Moto vitase ko mba no mi di me tuma. O mo mi ska kura me tima a ko master on. Na a se ma sha se bia. Na ko aji mi. Ah mi mi di mi di spa gunu so ni penaliza. Ti me ma mi free adwo mo bo mo se mi ntwe ska se ma sha ba adwo mo. Ti ka mi nya ska na ka. But the common master now, we saw him twenty-five million. I come up with some phone, so I won't share my fist to each other. I'm a penna one thing, I'm the apple. Gender activist Equia Efriye supports the children with food and clothing. They are looking up to the government to help get them out of the street. You bet me a young quadai every month, and so every son quadai, and yes, one more mobile no wow, one more sign in the month, and so on my gun, I'm a Huna man, and say, one more and a quiet arm robbers, one more to why I do money, no cross for small one, or bang in it. If we don't get the children off the streets, they are the same ones who will turn armed robbers and terrorize us. Evil thoughts will fill their minds and they will commit crimes without conscience. The females will turn sex workers and be impregnated. For Joe News, Nana Bochi Dankwa Yadom, Kumasi. Here's a farmer engaging the services of persons with disabilities with the hope to give them opportunities to improve their livelihood through their work on the farms. He also uses proceeds from that farm to give educational scholarships to some children in his community. He's been able to establish a bakery to support his staff and community and guess what he also established a solar lamp manufacturing unit to provide free solar lamps to persons living in island communities in the Adan enclave of the greater Accra region these interventions among others won him the 2023 joy news impact maker award of the year in the following piece we'll bring an up close with isaac ajaoto after he was a judge the overall winner at the maiden edition of the Joy News Impact Makers Awards held in Accra last month. Adar East is one of the 29 districts within the Greater Accra region. It is situated in the eastern part of the region. Adar is well noted for its annual Asafotufian festival. The people of Adar are predominantly fisher folks and farmers. Unemployment is high within the district. Isaac Ajauto is a lab technician and a native of Adan. He has been working hard to change the narrative by helping his people with his widow's might. He has an NGO called Farm for Livelihood Association. The Farm for Livelihood Association supports the less privileged, brilliant but needy, and the disabled in the Adan East District. I'm happy now more people, many people are seeing what we are doing and then people are ready to support and they want to come in to help. So we are happy, we are grateful. We thank um, Joy News and Multimedia Group for this opportunity given to us and then the platform that we have that people will see all that we are doing. So, so this is one of the many communities where Mr. Isaac Ajauto does his um, uh, supporting works for the community. And indeed, this is a farm which belongs to um, one man called Mr. Joshua. He's a person living with disability and he's the one marketing this very farm here. So I am a person who everybody will know me as a disabled person. Before I will start, I will start the farm. So I don't have uh, my money. Money is my problem. I have. If you will direct me, say I will let me take this money small or buy something small, and then you will do the farm. Uh, that uh, the thing that I want to I want to in the farm so so he's a helpful man in our Adam for community. Just like Mr. Jauto mentioned, Joshua is not the only disabled beneficiary. Abraham is also one of the many other disabled beneficiaries benefiting from Mr. Jauto's benevolence. Pope Isaac Ajauto. Pope 
he wanted to add mobile money business to this, but currently the family business the expenses are so high, so we don't get enough support so that we can establish him with the mobile money. So he always tells me if we need the help or people can come on board to support so that he can also establish a mobile money business in addition to the airtime that he is selling. And then the card, also get some card, a time card that he can add to fly, he'll be selling. Yeah. So he needs support. The Farm for Livelihood Association has made several strides in the Adar East District, including the education sector. What we do basically is we provide a side group, third groups for the children to pay for their exam fees and any basic thing that they need to go to school. That's what the farm for school is. Currently, this school we have some of the children that we also support in the community. Some friends and family members of Mr. Ajauto, who has known him and his works for years, could not be left out in sharing their stories to join us. He's actually been a blessing to the community. And in this community, I die here. In fact, employment is very difficult. And actually, students complete, and because of lack of employment, they engage themselves into all kind of vices which are not actually good. We are pleading that it involves a lot of money. There are times he's in short, short of money, and some of us he used to call us, but at times it's not always that we also have. Mr. Ajauto has been doing so many things for this community. You know, because we don't have, we are not on the national grid, don't have light. He normally surprise the uh, surprise the school children with uh, solar lamps, which help them to study. So, what has what has these awards been to you? Um, I'm very much happy that I won this award, and uh, not only me, but for the community. We are so happy, and uh, people are happy. Everybody in the house are happy, and then the communities they are all excited. So we are very much happy winning this award. KNUST scientists have predicted Ghana's greenhouse gas emission is expected to double by 2030. The study led by Dr. Yen Adam Sokama Nyuyam of the Department of Petroleum Engineering was arrived at, uh, arrived at this conclusion based on recent findings. As a country, we need to fight climate change. And climate change is driven by greenhouse gas emission. Um, we as a country, we have made it our priority to reduce greenhouse gas emission. The government have said it time and over, they are aiming to reduce emission by about 15% by the year 2030, which is a very good ambition. Now, if we decide that we want to reduce emission, first of all, we need to know the emission rate of our country. We need to be able to monitor it. That means we need to have some tools that can help us to monitor and we need to be able to predict our emission into the future. Uh, as a country, we've done well in collecting emission data. From 1990, uh, we have collected a lot of emission data which are in different institutions. Okay. What we did was simply bring these emission data together and uh, try to analyze them to see how our emission has been changing over the years. And then based on that, we use machine learning to try to predict our emission into the near future. And we've done the prediction from 2016 to 2030. And based on the study, actually, if we are going by our current trajectory, our emission is not going to go down by 15% uh, by the year 2030, but rather is going to more than double by the year 2030. So that was what this research was all about. Then another finding that we made was that most of our emission that is coming from the energy sector is coming um, from the transportation. Um, that is driving off cars and stuff like that. Yeah. Now, the reasons are that most of us use cars. I think as a country, you either have a car or at least you are aiming to buy one. Um, and also, most of our cars are pretty old. We, we, even as a person, I'm using a used car. Every one of 
most people in Ghana drive used cars, and these cars are not fuel efficient, so they tend to emit more uh, greenhouse gases into the environment. So one uh, solution that we propose is mass transportation. Now, you may propose, uh, for example, electric vehicles, but how many people in Ghana can afford electric vehicles? Do we even have the power to be able to power these cars around? You know, you may propose maybe solar vehicles. That is more realistic, but even that, uh, to what extent can we be able to get this within uh, this time space of, let's say, 2023 to 2030? We will not be able to get that. But we can, we can begin to build infrastructure for mass transportation. We can travel by train. Okay, the government is trying to develop that. So we can invest in these areas and it will help us to reduce emission. Another area we can go is to blend our fuel. Instead of using just the fossil fuels, we can go into biofuels, which we have technology in this institution to, to produce. And then we blend it with uh, the fossil fuels and that will reduce emission uh, as well. So these are some of the areas that um, we have looked at. We're still live on Joy News today. We are coming to you from our studios in Kokomimi. Let's take a break. When we return, we'll bring you the very latest from the world of business. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the business segment on Joy News today with me, Pius Kojo Baka. Government statistician Professor Samuel Kobnenim has challenged policymakers to take a critical look at factors contributing to the increase of food inflation. Food inflation has consistently seen an increase of 20 percentage points compared to non-food inflation. Speaking to journalists after announcing the inflation rate for June 2023, which increased marginally to 42.5% compared to the 42.2% uh, recorded in May, Professor Enim said that prices of common staples such as vegetables continue to record an increase over the period. Aggregating the rate of inflation for the month of June 2023 into two broad components that is locally produced items and imported items and also from a food and a non-food perspective. Food inflation for the month of June 2023 stood at 54.2% relative to non-food inflation 53.4%. This signifies about a more than 20 percentage point difference between food and non-food inflation for the month of June 2023. We keep on recording a widening of the gap between food and non-food inflation in the last three months. On a month-on-month -month basis, we also record a 1.3 percentage point between food inflation and non-food inflation, with food inflation June 2023 standing at 3.9% and non-food inflation month-on-month 2.6%. -month we continue to see the dominance of imported items in the, in the consumer price index and rate of inflation. Imported items for the month of June 2023 stood at 44.5% relative to locally produced items 35.9%, indicating about a 9.0 percentage point difference between imported items and locally produced items. We do this aggregation at the 13 division level, keeping in mind the national inflation figure. We identified five divisions that recorded rates higher than the national figure. This was led by personal care, social protection, and miscellaneous goods and services, recording an inflation figure of 55.1%, which was about 13 percentage points higher than the national inflation rate of 42.5%. Moving on to some other stories, as the finance minister prepares to present the media budget this month, more business associations have appealed to government to seize the opportunity to reduce high taxes affecting private sector growth. The latest to join uh, the call is the Chamber of Young Entrepreneurs, which has called for a reduction in taxes. Speaking to Joy Business ahead of the media budget review, Chief Executive of the Chamber of Young Entrepreneurs, Sharif Ghali, explained that many SMEs have struggled to stay afloat after uh, the upward review of some taxes in the 2023 fiscal year. Go to our market, go to the SMEs run. How many of them are even scaling up with all the support we are giving them? So we need to be realistic with all the support. And aside that, I think that going forward, I would want to see a lot of release. I know there are plans to review our taxes because of the IMF agreement. I think that anything that will increase any tax component is going to be a big issue for SMEs. Mm -hmm. Already we are struggling. And you see, we mm -hmm. have little to do when it comes to what government also want to do to meet up their revenue target. But I'm right. telling you what I think, if we should continue in this time, Jen, then we will continue to get SMEs that are folding now because just last VAT increment and a few other things that were announced, other SMEs have been, you know, they, they have closed. 
because they can't operate in such a, a, a ecosystem. So going forward, I I want to beg. I don't. I know our review. There will not be anything new, anything surprising to the ecosystem. But the, if there is, the business community would would be in a very tough situation at this moment. That's all for business for now. I am Pius Kojo Baka. At 1 p.m., Darrell will be here with the marketplace. There is more after this break. Thank you for staying with us. This is the sport. I'm Gary Alsman. The Ghana Football Association, as we speak, is announcing the launch of the National Football Philosophy, which they say will depict Ghana's football DNA. It will be the style with which Ghana football will be known, and it's a document that captures Ghana's style of play as well as coaching. It's ongoing at the Africa Trade House Conference Room, and my colleague Fento Tahiru Fento is there, joins us on the phone. Fento, good afternoon. Yes, Gary. Yes, we are seeing pictures on our screen. Tell us what's going on. Yeah, basically the launch of the Ghana Football Philosophy, as you rightly said. Uh, GFA President Kesho Kriku has described it as the biggest gift to Ghana football. It's a document that basically outlines the way footballers will be developed in Ghana. It's supposed to guide coaches in how to start um, coaching our players all the way from the under seven level to the senior national team level. And to do this, the GFA say that they are going to create regional national teams across the country where coaches will be embedded in schools uh, who will teach these players at the very basic level at under seven, under nine, under eight, all the way to under 23. One of the things that they've identified, according to Ben Ali Petch, the technical director, he said in putting together the document, he spoke to over 200 people, from ex-players, coaching instructors, to even traditional leaders about their opinion on Ghana football. And he came to a conclusion on what the Ghanaian footballers' uh, weaknesses are and what his strengths are before he went ahead to develop this document. So it's basically a guideline. He's currently taking the media and the uh, football fraternity present here, and there's a lot of them here, a lot of ex-players from Tony Bafo to Larry Kinson, Richard Kinson, Jock Pinsel, coaches, Didi Tramani, Yusuf Paziki, Parkwesi Fabian, all of them are here. He's taking us through a PowerPoint presentation on what is required at each level uh, under seven, what they should be teaching, at the nine, what they should be teaching, at the fourth, what they should be teaching, under fifteen. And it's not just tactics, there's a technical aspect, there is a tactical aspect, there's a psychological aspect of it, as well as a physical aspect of it. And all of these, they say, should be incorporated into the teaching. We have not yet had opportunities to ask questions, and the presentation itself is not over yet. And so we will be looking forward to finding out how they intend to train coaches to be adequately prepared to implement these policies. And obviously the clear challenge of how, uh, given that a lot of the talent that comes through comes from the clubs, how they intend to embed these in the Ghana Premier League clubs uh, who have been mandated to start youth teams across the country. So um, that presentation is currently ongoing still. Ben Hart is taking us through some PowerPoint presentations. But basically, he highlighted what the problems were, uh, what our potential solutions are, and that's the document he's taking us to right now um, with people very keenly watching. And All right. Fento Tahiru, the Joy Sports team, and he's at the venue of the launch of the Ghana Football Philosophy. He'll be bringing us more reports later. That's it for the sport. Gary Al Smith here. Showbiz is next. Time now for showbiz and VGMA Gospel Artist of the Year PCSI is promising patrons at un an unforgettable night in God's presence at the YME concert happening on July 29 at the Dominion Centre in London. Speaking to Joy Entertainment's Becky, PCS also revealed what she will do if she catches her husband cheating on her. In fact, um, me, that is my opinion. Right. Um, let me say, if I have my, if my husband cheat, which I, I, I think is gonna be, is, is not gonna be like that. Yeah. But if it is like that, 
I don't think that I will leave my husband for the cheater. I mean, the 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 the, the other lady. I won't, I won't I won't do that. I will make sure that I will settle with my husband. Then I I will leave my husband instead of leaving my husband for the other lady. I also know that you have a show in London. Is this your first show in London in the year? Let me let me say that. And uh, tell me about tell me about it and what we should expect today. It is. On the 29th of this month, PSA is having uh, my, if at least, I, I mean, it's a fresh in London. That's my first show in London. So 29th of this month, July, at uh, Dominion Center, PSA is having Wayemiye concert. At, in fact, we have put in concert, but it's not going to be a concert. It's going to be all the ministration. I mean, the people of God are going to experience the power of God. So, 29th of this month, we are going to experience the power of God. That's it for showbiz. That's how we also wrap up the bulletin this afternoon. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Log on to myjournaline.com. There's more of the news and updates of all the developing stories, including Lancentia Exams Education Ministry set up committee to investigate cause of mass failure. Do enjoy the rest of our programs. <laughs>